Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Criterion Collectors. I'm your co-host, Tim Rosenberger. And I'm your co-host, Rosalie Lewis. And today we're going to be discussing the three film, um, it's the Andre Gregory and Wallace Shawn three film um, set, which includes uh, My Dinner with Andre, Vanya on 42nd Street, and A Master Builder. And these films uh, range from quite, uh, they spend quite a bit of time from 1981 to 1994 to as recently as 2014. As the title suggests, they all involve um, Andre Gregory, who is better known for his stage work, I think primarily stage directing, and Wallace Shawn, who's done a lot of stage work and a lot of playwriting and obviously a lot of character work in film, best known for stuff like, obviously, Princess Bride, um, he had a recurring part in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and he's been in a lot of Woody Allen films, and, you know, if you do not know his name, I can almost assure you you've seen him in something, so... This is them collaborating together in uh, various capacities over these three films. I guess before we get started, had you uh, seen any of these films before? Or, I mean, obviously you'd probably, you had seen some Wallace Shawn stuff before, but had you experienced anything Andre Gregory had uh, been involved with before? So I had seen My Dinner with Andre. It's been probably, I'm going to say about probably eight or ten years since I'd seen it. But I did remember that movie, and I remembered liking it because it's so different from you know a lot of narrative films which i'm sure we'll get into and then of course besides you know princess bride and clueless which are two favorite films of mine that wallace sean did um andre gregory i was somewhat familiar with because i had recently watched the mosquito coast and he plays a preacher in that movie so his face was familiar to me but yeah my my dinner with andre was my introduction to these movies um, but th- it had been such a long time that it was good to revisit that and then take that into these next two films, which I had not seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had, I mean, obviously, I mean, m- if you were a film person, you have heard of My Dinner with Andre, whether you've watched it or not, you um, have at least heard of it, probably. Um, the other two I had not um, heard of, unless there was relation to the set. I mean, I had heard Andre Gregory mention it. Um, uh, Vanya on 42nd Street once, but I had not uh, seen that or a master builder. Okay, so why don't we get into uh, the first film, My Dinner with Andre. My Dinner with Andre um, was a film that was written by both Andre Gregory and Wallace Shawn. And it was, it's the concept, once you hear it, will probably seem like something that you would think they would have done for the stage, because it's a very kind of, it would be something that would be very kind of appropriate to do for the stage. But they, have uh, for whatever reason, wanted to film it and not do it on stage. And actually, I don't know if it ever actually has been put to stage before. But it caught the attention, or they submitted it, I forget which, to... Um, the director Louis Mall, who has done, I think, believed had done a lot of documentary work, also did the Oscar-nominated film Atlantic City, and has done a lot of a lot of stuff. Basically, the film follows um, Mall Sean and Andre Gregory, who are both called by their real names, and uh, they share certain biographical similarities and certain. I mean, they both involved have been both involved in the theater. Mall Sean's a playwright in it, but they have both stated that while they're going by their names and there are certain similarities with their characters and themselves they are not playing themselves and they've even stated that if they ever did remake the film they would switch the parts just to kind of make that clear but it's about um wallace sean is having a dinner with a man i'd been avoiding literally for years his name was andre gregory at one time he'd been a very close friend of mine as well as my most valued colleague in the theater In fact, he was the man who had first discovered me and put one of my plays on the professional stage. When I'd known Andre, he'd been at the height of his career as a theater director. The amazing work he did with his company, The Manhattan Project, had just stunned audiences throughout the world. But then, something had happened to Andre. He dropped out of the theater. He sort of disappeared. For months at a time, his family seemed only to know that he was traveling in some odd place like Tibet which was really weird because he loved his wife and children. He never used to like to leave home at all. Or else you'd hear that someone had met him at a party and he'd been telling people that he talked with trees or something like that. Obviously, something terrible had happened to Andre. And the almost the entirety of the film is of this 
almost two hour film is just them at a dinner table at a restaurant uh, talking about what Andre the character has been up to and, you know, uh, about life, about the theater, about the future of people and, you know, how we experience life and all sorts of uh, deep topics like that. So do you feel like this was a good thing to uh, put to film or do you think this would have been better for the stage? Because, again, obviously it is just two people, almost the entirety, just two people talking at a uh, restaurant table. I can see where it would make a good stage play, but I also think film conveys the intimacy of their dinner much more than a play would because you can't get those close-ups on the faces if you were seeing this in a theater even a small theater I think you'd miss some of their really close interactions and because this is such an intimate conversation between the two of them where a lot of it is in the reactions of Wallace Shawn to what Andre Gregory is saying or you know little reactions you see from even the waiter coming in and you know trying to be unobtrusive as they're having these really impassioned conversations i think some of that would be missed in a theatrical performance so there'd probably be ways to account for it but i'm glad that it's on film and i think it was probably the first of its kind in a lot of ways to do something this seemingly small that's you know like almost no stakes right it's just a conversation, a filmed conversation, but it feels very organic and and realistic. It, it feels like we're listening in on just two friends talking. And in a lot of ways, I can think of how its influence may have extended out. I mean, I think of in movies like The Trip with Coogan and Bryden. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of, you know, even certain podcast styles that just seem to be you're listening to a conversation between people. I do think that it's influential. And I can think of like, you know, Richard Linklater, for example, some of his movies are very modeled on this simple style. You know, even the first in the before series, for example, is pretty much just a conversation. So I think that there's definitely merit in having it filmed. That's that's my long answer to a short <laughs> question. I'm glad it was put to film, too. Obviously, just the fact that we could, you know, see it, and you didn't have to be, like, at a specific place at a certain time to happen to see this stage show. But I found it, strangely enough, I found it... I mean, I really wish I could see it, period, but I really wish I could have seen it when it was new in a theater with people, because it felt like a very good movie that would be good for a communal kind of shared experience, in a way, even though you wouldn't necessarily be... You maybe would react a little bit to it uh, with you know, the crowd you're watching with, but I think just the experience of when the movie ends and kind of experiencing the people and their quiet reactions to it as you're leaving and the kind of atmosphere in the air, I think would be very interesting. I guess you can get with the stage show too, but um, I don't know. I think if you like a movie, it's a bit, it's a bit different. I know what you mean. I feel like movies like this one, not just the subject matter of their conversation, but the intensity of their conversation about things that really matter to them it would inspire conversations like that. Like you would leave the theater and immediately want to have a dinner with a friend and have these kind of deep, wide ranging conversations or, you know, go out and grab a drink or a coffee with somebody you haven't seen in a while. Because I think it, for me, it made me realize, you know, how few of these really significant conversations we get to have anymore or that we make the time for. So I, I really appreciated that, and it definitely reminded me of, you know, conversation I would have, for example, in college where, you know, a friend and I would go to Denny's and talk at, like, 11 at night and, you know, like, not even look at our, our watches or mm-hmm. our phones or whatever. And I think for whatever reason, as we get older, we tend to have fewer of those conversations, and I think that's a, a lost art in a way. So, anyway, I liked it. I think, oh, well, I think part of it, too, is just that, I mean, obviously, as we get older, we have more commitments and... You know, some of us have children and stuff like that, so it's just very hard to carve out that time. Or even if you want to carve out that time, it's like, oh, I have to get home, I have to put the kid to sleep, or, Mm -hmm. you know, I have to go do this or do that. So we have less time for those kind of carefree, just, you know, get lost in conversation for hours and stuff. And um, I don't know, I always wonder if the characters have experienced that too, because they kind of talk about how there's certain things that you just can't talk about with people. And by the way, it was very odd at the beginning of this film, because while Sean is narrating as he's going to the, traveling to the restaurant, which is in New York, by the way, to get to this dinner, and he's expositing about himself and the Andre Gregory character in the film. 
And uh, it was very odd when he mentions that he's 36. Yes. Uh, because uh, I, I always so think much of, older. Yeah. Well, be, well it's just because uh, I always think, I mean, it, obviously, you know, when a man goes bald, it, you know, makes him much older than he is from, you know, very quickly. But Wallace Shawn, it's hard for me to believe, think of him as anything younger than like 40 in anything yeah. that he does. So it was very, and he was like 37 or something. So I think they were pretty much the right ages and stuff. But I think it adds to the film because it is him. I mean, because Andre Gregory is a bit older. I think he, I don't know, is maybe nine or eight or nine years older. Yeah. So he's a bit, so he's, you know, in his mid 40s at this point. But they're both people who are uh, rather middle aged or going into middle age. So they're kind of approaching their new section of their life and kind of maybe thinking more deeply and, and differently about life and kind of what, where, you know, they are going, where the human race is going. I noticed a few different things on this rewatch. The first being how good a listener Wallace Shawn is in this movie, because yes, it's a conversation between them, but for a lot of it, it's Andre just like monologuing and that, you know, could tend to like cause someone to glaze over potentially. But I felt like Wallace Shawn, he gives him such good reactions and he really seems like he's intently listening and paying attention. And, when he finally does get his chance towards the end to kind of contribute his own thoughts, you know, they again get like very lively, but I just really appreciated what a good listener he was and how much fun it was to watch his reactions to what essentially seemed like a monologue. The other thing that I I noticed is how frequently there were allusions to Nazis, uh, Hitler, yeah, yeah, uh, swastikas, you know, concentration camps. I mean, it was a lot of conversations about that, and that stood out to me this time. Yeah, I noticed that, yeah, the Nazi stuff. I mean, I mean, it's not like they discussed it, like, a lot, but Andre Gregory does make a lot of allusions to this being, like, this person that was a Nazi and this being, like, this Nazi thing and whatever. So that was a bit uh, interesting. But, yeah, for... I mean, Wallace Shawn does... I don't know. I didn't check. But I know maybe around the middle of the film starts talking a little bit more. Not a lot, but a little bit more. And then by the end, he is talking uh, a lot more. But yeah, for the first half, maybe a little bit more, he's pretty much, for the most part, just listening. And, I mean, props to Andre Gregory for, I mean, obviously they're stage people, but for memorizing this long, many, many, <laughs> many pages yeah. of, of dialogue. I mean, I can't imagine just... I mean, just all the stuff. I mean, just all the talking he does in this movie. I mean, with the movie about talking, he does the majority of it, so it's impressive to say the least. But let's talk about the shooting of the film. Um, obviously, there's only so much you can do with shooting a film with two two people at a table. But I found I got wrapped up enough in what they were talking about that after a while, I just kind of forgot about stuff like you know the cinematography and all that stuff. I just kind of got wrapped. I kind of forgot about the fact that they're sitting at a table and I just kind of got wrapped into the conversation and the, the, what could be kind of a a static nature of the film just kind of, uh, kind of went away. Yeah, I agree. The one thing I did notice that I thought was really smart is that they position them at a table where there's a mirror, um, next to them. And that way you do get more of the reaction shots. So you can see most of the time you can see both of their faces, at least partially, if it's in a two shot. Like, obviously, when it's a one shot, you see the, the person talking. But when they do two shots, it actually shows you kind of both of their faces um, using the mirror. And I thought that was clever. And I also did enjoy the kind of seeing just little bits of the background of the restaurant. You never see any of the other diners, I don't think, but you do see the bartender, you do see the waiter kind of preparing things in the background so that it reminds you that, that they are in this restaurant setting. It's not just the two of them talking in the living room, for example. Um, you do see them when he first when they first get there, but yeah, when they, sit, when they sit down at the table, you might see a little bit of them in the mirror and maybe you see somebody go across the camera as some of them are leaving and stuff. You hear them in the background stuff, but mm-hmm. yeah, for the most part, yeah, you don't get really any wide shots or anything after they sit down it's just them uh just uh, some closer shots what did you think of some of the things the things that they were discussing some of the life experiences that andre was having and some of the bigger ideas about you know people and life and all that stuff i enjoyed hearing how animatedly andre was talking about his experiences of you know going to poland being in a forest with like 40 people that don't speak any english and just kind of seeing what happens 
and how that really like enlivened him and made him think of theater as something more than just what happens on the stage, but like our lives are theater and he kind of goes into that. But what we do is just sit there and wait for someone to have an impulse to do something. Now in a way that's, that's something like a, a theatrical improvisation. I mean, you know, if you were a director working on a play by Chekhov, you might have the actors playing the mother, the son, or the uncle all sit around in a room and do a made up scene that isn't in the play. For instance, you might say to them, all right, let's say that it's a rainy Sunday afternoon on Soren's estate and you're all trapped in the drawing room together. And then everyone would improvise saying and doing what their character might say and do in that circumstance. Except that in this type of improvisation, the kind we did in Poland, the theme is oneself. So you follow the same law of improvisation, which is that you do whatever your impulse as the character tells you to do. But in this case, you are the character. So there's no imaginary situation to hide behind. And there's no other person to hide behind. What you're doing, in fact, is you're asking those same questions that Stanislavski said the actor should constantly ask himself as a character. Who am I? Why am I here? Where do I come from? And where am I going? But instead of applying them to a role, you apply them to yourself. I enjoyed hearing his descriptions of the beehive. A beehive is, at eight o'clock, a hundred strangers come into a room. I said, yes. He said, yes, and whatever happens is a beehive. And I said, yes, but what am I supposed to do? He said, that's up to you. Well, I was terrified, Wally. I mean, in a way, I felt on stage. I did it anyway. So I decided that when the people arrived for the beehive, that our group would already be there singing this very beautiful song and that we would simply sing it over and over again. People started to sit with us and started to learn the song. Now, there is, of course, as in any performance or improvisation, an instinct for when things are going to get boring. So at a certain point, although it may have taken an hour to get there, an hour and a half, I suddenly grabbed this teddy bear and threw it in the air, at which 140 or 30 people suddenly exploded. You know, it was like a, a, a Jackson Pollock painting. You know, human beings exploded out of this tight little circle that was singing a song. And before I knew it, there were two circles dancing. But a lot of it, too, um, could potentially come as, across as very, in, like, self-indulgent or pretentious. But somehow, he's so charismatic that I think he sells it in a way. Like, I don't agree with everything he said, but he's no. saying it with so much passion that you can't help but be caught up in it, which, again, I think is credit to not just the, the script, but I think the, the performances. But I enjoyed when Wallace, or Wally, as he kind of is called in this movie, I, I enjoyed when he pushes back on some of the things. Like, Andre Gregory is talking about how you know, electric blankets are, <laughs> are some sort of like ill for society because it protects us from the seasons and, you know, it can like lull you into a sleep, not just like literally, but mentally, you know, he's talking about how comfort kind of deadens us to the world. And Wallace Shawn is just kind of like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, my life is hard enough. I'm looking for more comfort because the world is very abrasive. So like, can I have these little comforts? Yeah, and I, I I loved that. I thought that it was a good thing for him to push back on. I love Andre uh, Wallace Shawn's. It's a thing, a speech he makes near the end of the movie where he is pushing back on some of these ideas that Andre Gregory has been talking about. Where I mean, he basically says, I understand what you're saying, but I also don't understand what you're saying. And he has this speech about, which I love, which is kind of just about him embracing kind of and, and kind of speaking for the little things in life. I just don't know how anybody could enjoy anything more than I enjoy uh, reading Charlton Heston's autobiography or, uh, you know, uh, getting up in the morning and uh, having the cup of cold coffee that's been waiting for me all night still there for me to drink in the morning and no cockroach or fly has, has died in it overnight. I mean, I'm just so thrilled when I get up and I see that coffee there just the way I wanted it. I mean, I just can't imagine how anybody could enjoy something else any more than that. I mean... I mean, obviously, if the cockroach, if there is a dead cockroach in it, well, then I just have a feeling of disappointment, and I'm sad. But I mean, I, I just, 
I just don't think I feel the need for anything more than all this. But yeah, just these little things, you know, spending time with his wife and all this stuff, which I really love that speech. It's very kind of heartwarming and just kind of beautiful. And it's, yeah, a celebration of the kind of little things in life that can bring us, you know, happiness and, you know, give maybe meaning to our lives and stuff. I mean, that speech is probably my favorite part of the movie and the discussion. Yeah, I, that was a highlight for me, too. And it's funny because at the beginning of the movie in his voiceover, while as Sean is talking about how kind of difficult things are and how it seems like even going to this dinner is going to be an expense that he doesn't really want to have to worry about. And, you know, he's his wife has to work nights as a waitress because he isn't making enough money as a playwright. And, you know, he, he's sort of complaining to the audience in that voiceover. But then he I feel like comes to a realization during this dinner that those little things are the things that are keeping him going and that he doesn't necessarily want to trade places with someone like Andre who's got all this you know on we about the world and how we're living in a concentration camp that we built ourselves but we can't see the the bars or whatever it is um and it seems like Wallace realizes at that point that he does have happiness. It's not this elusive thing. It is something that's found in these little things. And I liked that. But I also loved, he has this great speech about, you know, fortune cookies and like mm-hmm. seeing seeing uh, purpose when really it's just chaos. And, you know, he talks about, well, the fortune cookie, it's tempting for me to read it and, of course, apply it to myself in some way. But the cookie has no way of knowing me. And, you know, it was just written by a guy at a factory years ago. I enjoyed that speech too, because he, he's kind of not poking fun, but he's kind of making Andre's kind of speech about all these coincidences that seem to mean something. He's kind of like, well, it doesn't mean anything, but I, you know, it's tempting for us to think that way, but think about what it would imply. And, you know, it's just a, it's a great um, rebuttal to some of the more high flute things that have been said, but he says it in such an eloquent way. And I, I really enjoyed that conversation because to me, examples of civil disagreements are so rare these days. It seems like any conversation that you get into where two people disagree tends to become heated and emotional and, you know, people retreat to their opposite ends and you can't convince anybody of anything. And I thought this was a great example of two people who clearly have conflicting ideas about various things in life but they're having a great conversation and they end the night as friends still and i I thought that was a a really refreshing thing too Mm -hmm. yeah maybe even slightly better friends than they were i mean i don't think they're going to be buddy buddies or anything but um i think maybe uh the wallace character is probably maybe a bit more inclined to talk with andre again despite i mean because he is andre i mean they're both to an extent a bit pretentious but Mm -hmm. uh, andre especially is pretty pretentious but again yeah he does get away with it i think partially because andre gregory does seem like a uh, sweet person in real life so you can kind of give that to his character and make you like him more than maybe you should in some cases but uh, one thing I do like about this film, and we can get into this about some of the other films too, is uh, obviously since uh, Andre Gregory and Wal Shawn uh, come from the stage as a big part of their live, and Louis Mal is stage stuff is important to him and stuff like that. Um, there is a you know even though this is not a stage show, there is still a lot of and you know obviously they're, obviously they're talking about the theater and what it is and all that stuff but also there's a certain uh theatricality about the way it's shot and just kind of how it's acted and you know the way things look and all that stuff did you uh notice that and kind of if you did did you like that yeah i did i again it doesn't feel like just your typical movie it it does have a, a real kind of theatrical feel to it and i liked that a lot it's interesting that I know in this film, I, there was, even though this was, you know, done, you know, this is a 1981 film, there's certain stuff they're talking about that um, still seem very relevant today about, you know, again, like the human race and people and what we're doing to the environment and um, all that. Did that stand out to you at all? Just kind of, you know, again, these topics from, oh, God, almost 40 years ago are still, you know, very relevant today. Yeah, especially when they were talking about all the horrible things that are happening in the world and needing an escape from them. And again, Wallace Shawn's talking about the world is an abrasive place. And he's not just talking about his own difficulties. He's like, you know, there's rapes that are happening and murders and children pushing their parents out of windows. And, you know, so they kind of chronicle some of the the bad stuff that's happening. And I think, of course, we still see horrible things happening today. Sometimes it's tough to watch the news because it is so depressing. So I thought that that felt 
certainly relevant and it was hard to believe that some of this was being talked about you know about 40 years ago So the next film in this series is Vanya on 42nd Street. This one is, again, directed by Louis Mal, And it's written this time by Andre Gregory, but it's adapted from the Chekhov play Uncle Vanya, which then in turn was adapted by David Mamet. So a lot of hands have touched this material. And in this film, it's a bit more structured. There's more of a plot because it's based on a film, or based on a play, I should say. But essentially, it starts out with uh, scene in New York where we're seeing various people on the street and then slowly we realize we're seeing people like Wallace Shawn, Julianne Moore, and other members of the cast coming together. They're on 42nd Street in New York City and they are going to rehearse a play. The play in this movie is being directed by our good friend here uh, Andre Gregory who of course is playing himself once again and in this movie, the play that they're putting on is Uncle Vanya. So you get to see a full rehearsal of the play. And at times they break, but very few times they break, you know, the rehearsal to start, you know, having a little smoke break or eating some food or having regular conversations. But for the most part, we're seeing the play being filmed on the stage. And this is a significant film because it was one of the early films for Julianne Moore. It was one of her breakout films. And she does put on a, a fantastic performance in this movie. I was also really impressed by Brooke Smith, who I guess is on Grey's Anatomy now. I don't watch that show, but she plays Sonia in the movie. So I hadn't seen any adaptations of Uncle Vanya. I hadn't read the play I guess I'm a, an illiterate person when it comes to Chekhov. I know about Chekhov's gun, but I haven't read any of his stuff or seen any of his plays. But it was interesting to see how this all came together and the way that they were able to make it feel super modern, even though obviously the play itself was written in 1899, so quite some time ago. What did you think of the movie? Uh, I thought it was interesting. I love the kind of uh, play within a movie thing. Again, we, we do have Andre Gregory playing himself. We have Wallace Shawn when he's not playing, because he plays Vanya in the movie, Uncle Vanya. When he's not playing Vanya within this play, within the movie, he's uh, assumingly him. Uh, he, he's himself, and I guess the other actors are themselves, too. We don't get names for them, so we don't know if Julianne Moore is playing Julianne Moore, playing her character. But um, I found that uh, interesting. And just this kind of not really a love letter to theater, but just really this kind of, of a really good representation of what theater is on film in a way that's a bit different. Just again, by just, I mean, cause they could have just done like a straight adaption of it or even done like, you know, a film stage ish, you know, version of this and not had the kind of uh, the frame for it. But I don't think mm-hmm. it would have uh, captured the feeling of the theater quite as well. And just, I mean, just little things like one point they have kind of a, very brief kind of intermission in the middle of the film um, where they eat and stuff like that. Let's take a little break. (laughs) (laughs) Used to be so nice when you smoked too. Now I'm the only one. Sorry, sir. I love to go to Milwaukee. They have wonderful restaurants there. Right. Yes. Now, did you find any place good to eat in Hartford? No, no. Yeah, and that's on me. You know, I have an Indian guru. You do? Yes, guru. He's a great teacher. Just having those little discussions, just very quickly. And just the kind of the mood and stuff. From my experience of doing theater stuff, it just kind of captured that uh, perfectly. So I love those aspects of the film. Did you kind of like that aspect as well of the theater uh, stuff? Yeah, I did. Um, it felt, yeah, it felt very meta, which was, you know, that's always fun. And I was a little taken off guard because I knew it was going to be a, a filmed version of a play in a way, but I didn't realize when the play had started in the movie because it happened so naturally it seems like the you know actors are just talking amongst themselves and then you realize oh wait this is the start of the play Mm -hmm. so i liked that because it kind of lulled me into thinking of them as real people when it was really them playing their characters and then in terms of the story of the play itself you know i guess 
if you're familiar with Chekhov, you probably already know that he tends to portray people who aren't necessarily the happiest. So we have basically a, a bunch of <laughs> miserable alcoholic characters, and that could sound like it would be a really boring or depressing play and not that fun to watch. But strangely enough, it's very alluring. And again, I think especially the, the women in this um, performance do an outstanding job of letting their passions show through the circumstances they find themselves in. And I really enjoyed especially the performance by Larry Pine. As far as the, the men, he stood out to me. He plays a doctor in the movie who um, two of the women are secretly in love with. And I thought that he did a really great job of being completely oblivious to their interest, it seemed. So, yeah, it was interesting to watch. The matter concerns my stepdaughter, Sonia. Yes. How do you feel about her? I respect her. Your feelings for her as a woman? My feelings for her? Yes. I have none. Uh, uh, um, two more words and I'm done. Have you perhaps remarked her attitude toward you? No. Well, then I'm done. I would say the story within this story, the Uncle Vanya story, I will admit, I, towards the end, I got more interested in it. Uh, I think part of my issue was initially I had a problem getting into it because I didn't realize, because I, again, I went to this pretty much blind, so I didn't know it was based on a play. I didn't know it was based on something by Chekhov or anything about the Uncle Vanya's play and all that stuff. So initially when they start doing the play, I just thought it was them rehearsing something that didn't really matter in the long term. So I kind of miss maybe some of the exposition that kind of got me, would get help me get me into the play itself that they're doing. But yeah, I found it, I don't know, I, I found it some stuff towards the end. Obviously the performances are all really good and stuff, but I found it personally kind of hard to get into the play, which maybe is just me not caring a whole lot about the Uncle Vanya story as a whole. So um, it wasn't as interesting of a watch for me as it was as the My Dinner of Andre movie was. Yeah, I would say out of the three movies that in this series, this was probably the one I liked the least, but that's not to say I didn't like it. I still found a lot of it really interesting. And again, like I, like you said, the performances are really good. I find Vanya himself to be probably the least interesting character in the, in the play slash movie. And I don't think that's taking away from Wallace Shawn's performance. I just think that's probably the way it's written. But the women are written much more interestingly, or at least performed much more interestingly, which is totally fine. I just, yeah, I, I found Vanya to be pretty pretty boring um <laughs> well it's, it's, yeah well because it's, it's called you know vanya on uh 42nd street the the play adaption of it that it was based on was just called vanya it's based on a play called uncle vanya and stuff mm -hmm. but really vanya is more of a minor not a minor character but he almost seems more supporting than anything else it really revolves more around uh, uh the julianne moore char character and the uh, Brooke Smith character and stuff like that than it does him. I mean, Julianne Moore is like, I think, plastered on the posters for this movie, so it feels like it's more of her film than it is uh, Wallace Shawn's uh, film. Yeah, it's definitely more about Yelena, the Julianne Moore character, and Sonia, and their, you know, unrequited love or their, you know, failings to find happiness than it is about Vanya, even though he has some key scenes for sure. I'm ugly. Beautiful hair, and you have beautiful oh, eyes. No, just... the unattractive woman is told that she has beautiful hair and beautiful eyes. I've loved him for six years. I love him more than I love my own mother. I always hear his voice, and I always feel his hand on my hand, and I always, I always look at the door like at any moment, and. I keep coming to you about him, and he's here. He looks right through me. All night long, I pray. I know I have no hope. Yesterday, I confessed to Uncle Vanya. All the servants know I love him. Everybody knows. What does he think? He doesn't notice me. 
It was a very interesting, I felt like it was a very interesting, like, experimental adaptation, and it's very stripped down. Like, you don't really get sets, you don't really no. get props, it's really just the people saying the lines to each other, but they say them in su with such conviction that you really start to forget that they're they're acting in a play within the movie. Mm. I, again, I thought that the the modern approach to a very old story was really interesting. It's not set in modern times or anything, but... The fact that it's just you've seen these people out on the, the streets in New York wearing their normal 94, 1994 clothing and having normal 1994 hairstyles and there's nothing to sort of separate them. So the dialogue then comes out and it sounds modern as a result, I guess. Yeah, kind of like uh, my dinner with Andre. By the end of the film, I could kind of forget the, the fact that, you know, the fact that there are, uh, we're just seeing actors on a stage and stuff. I just kind of forgot about that, and I was just kind of into the story. And I think I got more into their performances, because I think all these films, in good ways and bad ways, they do have a bit of theatrical acting, which sometimes can be a bit bad, because I think sometimes the acting isn't as... Not that the theater acting is bad, but they did acting that doesn't quite work on film as quite as well and it just didn't it felt a bit more um artificial and stuff with some of the line deliveries and stuff but i think by the end of the film i got kind of into it do you like that they did it this way or would you prefer them doing a more traditional way where it's actually a filmed version of vanya or like a stage you know a film stage show of vanya no i definitely preferred it this way i think to be honest i think if it had been like a traditional filmed version of the play i would have been less mm -hmm. interested because it took me probably 20 minutes or so to kind of get acclimated to the story of the play so I think it's good that I had the outside framing story around it because that way I was a little more invested in who these people were outside of their characters on the stage mm -hmm. yeah and you kind of forget that it's kind of interesting when they do have those breaks and stuff that like oh you know they start just acting like themselves quote unquote and you kind of I don't know it's this interesting kind of thing of just seeing actors turn off and you kind of remember oh yeah they're just playing characters yeah in this exactly. story you know they don't, while Sean doesn't actually hate you know <laughs> uh, this other one of these other actors and stuff and they're just you know right yeah so it was interesting I will say I want to call out my favorite sort of exchange in this movie which does happen towards towards the end of the film not all the way at the end between Wallace Shawn and Julianne Moore where Julianne Moore is kind of lamenting that you know she she fell in love with this older gentleman now she doesn't really feel that way about him anymore and so she's feeling very stifled and Wallace Shawn, who is, of course, in love with her, is trying to convince her to break out of her, you know, morality and do whatever is going to make her happy. And he says, Why are you languishing, my dear? My splendor? Wake up. Pulse with life. You, when the blood of mermaids courses through your veins, wake up to your mermaid life. For once in your life, let yourself go rise to the heights and then plunge into the frothy brine love with a water spirit awaits you in your guise as the naiad of perfection so that our hair professor and all of us can just throw back our heads and say who was that nymph and I loved that. I just it was it's such a memorable line that even though I again found Vanya to be fairly bland as a character those lines really stood out to me and i think when i think of vanya i'm going to be thinking wake up to your mermaid life Okay, so our last film is A Master Builder. Um, came, came out in 2014, though I am seeing now on its IMDb page. also has a 2013 date, so one of those, really. It says 2014 for the USA, so it might have premiered a year earlier uh, somewhere else in the world. But anyway, uh, this is the only film not directed by, I guess, Louis Mall is directed by Jonathan Demi, who you would know for stuff like um, Philadelphia and uh, Silence of the Lambs. Louis Mall, his last film was actually was uh, Vanya on 42nd Street. The film of Master Builder is is uh, dedicated at the end to uh, Louis Mall, so I think it's kind of 
them trying to uh, ch- he's I think Jonathan Demi is trying to channel him a little bit and this is maybe kind of a bit of a spiritual successor to those films and maybe just the work of Maul in general but this film is based off in a uh, Henrik Ibsen uh, play that Wallace Shawn translated for the stage and Andrew Gregory put on for the stage and then Wallace Shawn wrote the screenplay for this movie, A Master Builder. And uh, Wallace Shawn stars in it as the lead character, Halvard uh, Solness. Um, and Andre Gregory has a very small part as the father of somebody who works for uh, Wallace Shawn's character. And the uh, other guy is named uh, Ragnar, um, who is kind of doing kind of more small work for uh, Solness, who is called, uh, who is a master builder and is called the master builder. And Solness is kind of uh, holding Ragnar back because he doesn't want him to get ahead of him because uh, in his younger years, Solness kind of was, I think, that's the protege of Andre Gregory's character. And he kind of found a way to break off from Andre Gregory's character and kind of Andre Gregory's character kind of diminished. What weighs on me so terribly is what's going to become of Ragnar? Well, I mean, he can stay here with me for as long as he likes. You see, apparently he feels that he just can't stay any longer. What are you saying? Does he want a raise? No. It's more that the day has to come when he'll have the opportunity to do his own work. Well, but he just hasn't fully mastered that that much of the discipline. (laughs) He knows how to draw. Well, you hadn't mastered that much of the discipline either when you were working for me. But that didn't stop you from plunging in. And seizing the moment. And making a tremendous impression on everyone. No, it didn't stop you from luring away the wind that was in my sails at the time and it didn't stop you from just rushing past everyone around you. Yes, it worked out that way, didn't it? And uh, now uh, Andre Gregory's character is dying uh, while Sean's character is in very poor health too and it's just him kind of reflecting on his life and the mistakes he's made and his very messed up marriage with his wife played by uh, Julie uh, Haggerty. It seems like he's having, he's he claims that his, his wife and his doctor who's uh, played by Larry Pine who's again playing a doctor in this which is interesting he thinks that both of them think that he is suffering from mental problems though they deny this and early on in the film a, a young woman in her uh, early tw- early mid-20s uh comes to visit solness and um i won't say much more than that except that she reveals uh, something from uh, solness's past that he is rather lying about not remembering or he actually does not uh remember and the film takes uh, some interesting turns after that so this is an interesting movie. It's most different, I think, from the other films that we have talked about. And in some good ways and some bad ways, it's, you know, it's the most probably dramatic. It's the darkest of them. It has maybe some thriller aspects to it. How did you feel about that kind of change in kind of tone and kind of uh, mood about this one? So it took me a long time to get on this movie's level because... At first, I thought it was going in a direction that I was really, really uncomfortable with. Yeah. But but then it got me. So um, now I think it might be my favorite of the three. I need to kind of go back and watch the other two again to to truly decide that and like rewatch this one for sure. But it it got me. So I give it props for that because it kind of snuck up on me to become my my secret favorite. The beginning of it is it's very off-putting because everybody in it is somewhat unlikable, I felt, except for maybe the doctor. Um, they're all either like whiny entitled people or they're people that are probably a little morally bankrupt. Um, Wallace Shawn's character seems to certainly just kind of do whatever he wants and get away with it and like everybody, you know, caters to him, even his wife, who is clearly like... <laughs> she's put up with way too much in her life it seems you kind of get that sense even from the beginning is kind of like well it's my duty he's my husband and i was like oh come on 
<laughs> but then I, I finally like came around to figure out what this film was really doing. And then I was like, yes, this is a great movie. Stylistically, I thought it worked well, too, because it it felt a little bit like a play, but it also mm-hmm. cinematically. And there's some some things that Jonathan Demme does in this that are mm-hmm. a departure from what Louis Maul would have done, I think. Yeah, I mean, there are certain state stuff and uh, inspirations from there. Like, you don't, you're pretty much just in Solness's house. And any type of most, you know, time where they're looking out a window or something, you don't see what they're looking at and all that stuff. You've seen a lot of stuff described to you like you would in a play, which is, I think, a good thing and bad thing. But, oh, I do find it interesting because at first, when they first start the movie, it's shot almost in a way, it felt very kind of cheap in a way because there isn't much mm-hmm. lighting going on. It feels very much like a very kind of a digital uh, independent, cheap independent film. And at first I was like, eh, I don't know if I really like the way this looks. I mean, obviously the look of it and budget is not everything, but I don't know if a low budget film in in the digital age in this sense will look terribly good. But I think that was intentional because something happens partway through the film that, and then the cinematography does seem to change more to a filmed level. And then it does switch back eventually to the more digital, low budget feel to it. And I thought that was kind of an interesting way of change i don't want to say too much about it but changing the look of the film in a very subtle way to for a specific purpose did you notice that i did um and i noticed that the cinematographer declan quinn is somebody who'd worked on vanya as well Mm. um but he's also worked with uh jonathan demi at least on rachel getting married and ricky and the flash so he worked with demi a few times in addition to this movie but yeah i definitely noticed that the beginning of it seemed a little bland i guess for lack of a better term but there's some more cinematic qualities that come through as it goes on. And that was one of the things I noticed that Demi did that we didn't have in the, the mall incarnations, which is he would put in like insert shots that take you out of the immediate action and sort of break up the film a little bit, which we didn't have in the other two. The other two are very much filmed in just real time. And this one seems like it isn't necessarily wedded to that idea. Hmm. No, there's a lot of real time stuff in it. It's a lot of, yeah. I think it just, it's a lot of like, I mean, there's only really like, Oh God, four, five scenes in the whole movie really. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very, just a lot of long scenes of people talking again. So there's still a lot of stage uh, inspirations there. And it does help with the kind of the weird they shoot it is it is And it does kind of help with the weird feeling of the movie. Cause the movie, I mean, the actors really sell it, too, because they picked some really solid actors to kind of sell this very kind of off-putting tone uh, mm-hmm. that kind of goes throughout the whole thing um, and and sell the kind of off-putting content of the film because there's a lot of messed up stuff they talk about. Oh, yeah. In, uh, in this movie that, uh, yeah. What do you think was the kind of goal of the film? Because when I was watching it, I found it almost kind of, it's kind of hard, I can't quite remember my exact thought of of it, but it was kind of, I thought of it more of a kind of a story about these kind of messed up people. I don't know if it was about maybe them getting their comeuppance or something, but, you know, a dark story about dark people. And then I saw somebody talk about, you know, how it's a story of redemption and stuff like that, or at least the original Ibsen play can be seen as a story of redemption. And my first point of view about a movie about messed up people, I thought it worked better than a movie about redemption, which I didn't think it worked as quite as well as, but what did you think the kind of point of the movie was? I think the point of the movie is less about redemption and more about legacy, maybe to an extent. Um, I do think it's a little bit about the, the master builder's legacy, what he thinks it is versus what other people think it is. But I also think there's something here that almost, I mean, the play is from 1893, but so it definitely predates film noir, but there's a certain element in it. And I don't want to get too specific Mm -hmm. that I think could certainly be in a film noir. I could certainly see a certain element of this movie playing out with a different interpretation. Let's just say that could make it a, a more of a traditional thriller. Like you mentioned the thriller element. So that's subtle and it's not fully revealed until very, very late. But um, I thought that that was extremely effective. And I think that's why this worked for me, because if it had just been about messed up characters without, with nothing else, I don't think I would have liked it as well, but I think it, it empowered the people I wanted it to empower. I think that's about all I can say without revealing too much. 
we talked about for the my dinner with Andre part how much Andre Gregory is doing in that film and how much he's carrying that film and how much he has to do and say and all that stuff. I found it kind of sad that even though he's obviously involved with some of these stuff behind the scenes, like he helped produce this film with uh, uh, Andre uh, with uh, Wallace Shawn and stuff, that in terms of acting, he's doing less and less throughout the movie where he's just pretty much in the background as the director in a couple moments in Vanya and 42nd Street. And then in this film, he has really a scene and that's it. And then you don't, he's mentioned a little bit throughout the film, but you don't really see him again. I, I found it just kind of sad to, uh, that he was getting kind of less of a part because I wanted to see more of Andre Gregory, especially since I haven't seen nearly as much of him as an actor as I have uh, Wallace Shawn. Yeah, I was, I was wishing that there was more of him in it because I really loved him in my dinner with Andre. But I think maybe part of it is due to age and part of it is just due to his comfort level because he seems to really enjoy being more behind the scenes he you know because he's done the playwriting and stuff so i assumed that it had something to do with that but you're right he's not in this one very much at all like his presence is looming but his actual physical being is not there as much what did you think of she hasn't done a whole hell of a lot though i do know i think andrew gregory and demi were uh very complimentary about her after the film uh lisa joyce who plays uh, hilda the girl who comes into a solace's life near the beginning of this film what did you think of her because she i mean especially is just strange and she has this laugh which is very uncomfortable I think excels very well in her part. And I think it's part of the reason why this is as effective as it is. She was a force of nature. To me, the film completely belonged to Lisa Joyce. Her eyes, just her eyes. You don't even need the rest of her face or body. Her eyes say so much from the very first time that she is on screen. And she just is this force to be reckoned with. I loved her. I thought she embodied that part so, so well. And she has to carry a lot of different emotions and a lot of um, conversations between her and Wallace Shawn that, you know, because of his status in this movie, he's the master builder. And also his status outside of the movie. We know Wallace Shawn is a much more known, even though he's a character actor, he's clearly a much more known actor than, Lisa Joyce, who was basically an unknown at the time, but she completely holds her own in every single scene with him and I think brings things out of both Sean and also Julie Haggerty, who plays Halvard's wife. She brings things out of them that maybe another actor couldn't have or maybe they wouldn't have found in themselves without her to kind of be that foil. She just has this energy to her that is, I think, so rare, especially in a younger actor she just is a, such a force to be reckoned with i have been sitting here in this house with a feeling of being completely alone and and just sort of staring helplessly at absolutely everything and you know the funny thing is that i have become so disturbed by younger people what younger people they upset me so much that I've sort of closed my door here and locked myself in. I mean, I'm afraid that they're going to come here and they're going to knock on the door and then they're going to break in. Well, I think you should just open the door and let them in. Open the door? Yes. Yes. So that they can gently and quietly come inside and it can be something good for you yeah and just a natural way of putting off lines too she has certain especially more near the beginning of the film when wallace sean's character is trying to figure figure her out he's like well i mean the first thing you're going to do obviously is to go around to the shops and get some proper clothes for yourself <laughs> no i think i'm gonna omit that step oh. <laughs> But in a way, that's just like, again, it's very natural. And, and again, also kind of off-putting. And 
kind of sells this character who you don't really... Well, Sean t- mentions near the beginning of the kind of scenes together that he really can't figure her out and what her intentions are. And I think throughout the film, as an audience, you don't really quite understand what her intentions are because she kind of goes back and forth between somebody who almost seems like maybe she's trying to has some nefarious purposes but then also almost seems like she's trying to help the character other characters in the film and then she doesn't seem like she's trying to help and you you never really i think quite figure out what what her deal is i mean you kind of know what her deal is but you don't really figure out what her intentions are coming to this place yeah she does capture that ambiguity really well because it, it changes moment to moment what you think about her. And I think her presence in the movie, it makes it so much more interesting because she is such an enigma, even though it's, again, like at the beginning, you're like, oh, I think I get what she's doing. And then you're like, wait, maybe I'm wrong. And then, you know, like it shifts throughout throughout the movie. And um, yeah, I thought she did a really great job with that. I'd love to see, I don't know how, what else she's been in, but I'd love to see anything else that she has done because she really brought something unique to that to that character you know her character we we sympathize with her to a certain extent because of certain stuff that in her backstory but we also it, again i have to say she's off-putting because we don't know how quite there she is and you know in certain points it's just kind of like you know i do sympathize with her but then at some points i'm like i don't know if i do want to sympathize with her because she seems a bit unstable and then you know, it just goes back and forth, and it's just, yeah, it's, uh, I think, perfectly done, and again, I think that was the intent, and it's perfectly, I think, done by her and uh, the writing and directing. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I also really liked Julie Haggerty as mm-hmm. Celine, as the wife. I've recently rewatched What About Bob, which she's great in uh, as the wife in that movie. She just has such a gentle presence, and I also watched Lost in America because I've been going through the Albert Brooks movies that are mm-hmm. on the channel. I'm sure we'll talk about later. And she, you know, she's great in those those movies, but this was obviously significantly after that time. I don't know how much, you know, work she'd been getting. So to see her again on the screen was really nice, and I, I really appreciated the vulnerability that she brought to this role. Yeah, she's very... Well, at first she maybe seemed more of kind of a... just a bitter woman and kind of... Maybe this is a bit harsh, but maybe kind of a wretched woman or maybe it's become one because of, under, maybe partially understandably because of Wallace Shawn's behavior in the film, and he's very obviously cheating on her and all this other stuff. So um, it's you could see why she would be the way she is and very kind of bitter about her marriage and all this stuff. It'd be a really good thing for you to have found that young woman, Halford. Oh, yes. She's just so useful in so many ways. Oh, yeah. She seems as if she would be. And she's uh, good at bookkeeping? Well, she's had an awful lot of practice at bookkeeping in the last two years. The other thing is, she's such a kind person, she's ready to do whatever comes up that needs to be done. Well, that certainly must give you a feeling of comfort, Halford. Well, it does, it does. It does, and it's been a long time since I've had anyone here who was available to look after my needs. Oh, Lord, how can you say such things? Oh, Aline, oh. now please forgive me. But then as the film goes on, especially near the end of the film, you can learn more about her backstory and kind of how the way she is. And you feel really kind of sorry for her by the end of the film and because she's just this kind of very tragic person who has been, you know caught in a marriage with somebody who in a way loves her but you know doesn't treat her as well as he should and doesn't quite you know approach his marriage the way he should and you know she's experienced a lot of tragic things and stuff so she's this kind of tragic person who's stuck in not really doing what she wants out of a worthy she's a lot obligation where she's just kind of she's almost she's a slave to what she feels are obligations and she's almost like in certain points of the film just breaking down and stuff because mm-hmm. she's so just uh, kind of just lost in this despair and stuff and yeah she's she's one of the most probably broken people I've seen in a movie before and she's just somebody who needs a, you know could, could be a better person if she was in a better environment with better people and more supportive stuff and maybe would allow her to heal more than this kind of broken house and you know family that she's in so are you happy to be moving over into the new house? I ought to be. 
Because he so much wants me to be happy about it. I'm sure that's not the only reason to be happy, is oh, it? Oh, yes, it is. Yes. That's my simple obligation in life, Miss Vongel, to do what he wants, simply to yield. But there are many occasions when it's terribly hard to beat one's spirit into the necessary submission. Oh, yes, uh, that must be hard. Yes, it is hard. If one isn't a better person than I am, at any rate. Miss Osolis, I mean, when, when someone's been through really hard times the way that you have. How do you know I've been through hard times? Your husband said that you had. Oh. He says so little about those things to me, but yes, it's true. I've been through quite a bit in the course of my life. Yes, I have. Yeah, I. she was the one that I felt the most tenderness towards as I watched the movie, for sure. What do you think of Jonathan Demme's kind of approach to this in general? I know some people felt that he was not a good successor to um, Louis, uh, Louis Maul for this film. Do you like his approach to it, or would you have maybe have liked to uh, uh, have seen Maul do this if he had uh, been alive to do it? Well, I mean, it would have, of course, been interesting to see what Maul would do to close out the trilogy. But I also feel like Demi is a great successor. And, you mm -hmm. know, maybe I'm biased because I love Jonathan Demi's work overall. I think he's a fantastic director. And I think his filmography in some ways is similar to Maul because he has done a lot of different types of movies. He's done, you know, the documentary style um, with some concert films and he's done some you know more experimental stuff and then he's done these more traditional narratives so i think it works very well i think he picks up that torch and runs with it and i think he's also a very empathetic director in and what i mean by that is you know he really seems to do well at capturing humans i think about um something wild uh as a, a great example of that or rachel getting married he just he captures something about humans who are flawed and are in difficult situations that they probably put themselves in, but he still captures their humanity. And I think he brought that to a master builder in a way that, you know, maybe another director wouldn't have been able to capture. So what do you think of uh, these films as a whole? And it's kind of like a set. They were not something that Criterion released uh, initially as a set. Um, I know like my dream of Andre was uh, like you know, spine number four or hundred something, and then Vanya five hundred something. And the master builder was like seven hundred something that they kind of eventually put in together as kind of a three film set. Did you would you recommend people watch this these three films as kind of uh, together, or you know, would it be better if they were separate? It's interesting to compare them to each other, but I don't think I personally would think of them as a set or a series. They're all very different, and especially because Wallace Shawn if you see him as the through line, because I think he's in each of these the most, much more so than mm -hmm. Andre Gregory, he is very different in each of these mm -hmm. as well. So, I mean, it's interesting to see them together, but no, I don't think you have to watch, you know, for example, you don't need to watch them in order. You don't need to see all of them to understand them all. You might get little insights by watching them in close proximity like we did for this, but I think you could get just as much out of watching them one off and, you know, not necessarily seeing the other. So I think the most critical one to watch if you're a film buff is My Dinner with Andre because mm -hmm. it's it's so influential. It was very different for its time. It's a great conversation and it's been parodied a lot in pop mm -hmm. culture. So just from a completed standpoint, I feel like, you know, if it's been parodied on The Simpsons, you owe it to yourself to at least, mm -hmm. <laughs> at least pursue uh, the original. And then I would say for me, A Master Builder would be the next one on my list. And to a, to a lesser extent, Vanya, but I think Vanya is great because especially if you love Julianne Moore, it's a great example of her early work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, all of them are worth seeing, in my opinion. I mean, again, it should be noted, if you don't like the sound of one of these films or maybe see them somehow through the Criterion channel, I know uh, My Dinner with Andre and Master Builder are both on Criterion channel. Vanya is not, though I watched it on YouTube. I rented it, so it is available streaming if you don't want to buy a d disc of it right away. But they all, they're available in the set, and they all are available individually so if you don't like one or two of the films you can you don't have to buy the set to get them through criterion but i mean i think it's interesting to watch them in a row in the sense that you're kind of seeing i mean obviously you've seen primarily Wallace Shawn, but a bit of andre gregory and again larry pines in two of these films you're seeing uh Wallace Shawn particularly uh i mean he starts out being 36 37 and then he ends with being whatever that is i guess 
late 60s, early 70s. Um, Mm -hmm. So you're seeing him kind of go through kind of portions of his life, and you kind of see that emphasized a bit in the film about, you know, my my dear Andre, he's getting close to being middle-aged, and he's thinking about that, and his future, Vanya, his the character of Vanya is middle-aged and he's or whatever he's in his 50s and he's thinking about kind of the waste potential of his life and you know how much he doesn't have to look forward to anymore because of that so then a master builder he's at the end of his life and he's thinking back on it stuff so this is kind of you know these three stages things that's kind of uh, interesting that I don't think you would get if you watched them individually or in a different order which again is a subtle thing which I don't think I don't know if it was even intentional but I just find it interesting but I think uh, for people who are interested in the theater or who are into the theater who love the theater I think My Journey with Andre and especially Vanya are particularly good movies to watch you know you kind of get a feel of that you learn stuff about the theater from My Journey with Andre and the discussions they're having and the stuff you're seeing in, in Vanya you just kind of get the feel of it and stuff so I think you can get in a subtle way, can I get a bit of an education about the theater and what it's like through those two films? Less so with uh, Master Brodo, because that's more of a film film. Okay, so uh, why don't we talk about some of the uh, Criterion coming soon? Uh, last episode, when we uh, were mentioning stuff that was coming in November, the only thing they had listed as of that recording was uh, the Essential Fellini uh, box set. Um, now, as we record this, they have ooh, a lot more listed, eight more films. Uh, four of which are in November. Um, we have uh, Girlfriends, Moonstruck, and Ghost Dog, and then uh, The Irishman for November. Um, and before we get into the December titles that they have listed, at least so far, what are your feelings about those uh, four films? First of all, I literally like jumped and screeched for joy when I saw The Girlfriends by Claudia Weil was finally going to be released properly. And um, this is a movie that I absolutely adore that I Mm -hmm. first came to because of the Criterion channel. Um, This is a a movie from the 1970s. It follows two young women right after college. It's influenced people like uh, Greta Gerwig. It's, I would say, you know, if for people that may have conflicted feelings about the likes of Woody Allen, this is a movie very much in the same vein. It's set in New York and it's, in the 70s and it's conversational it's funny so definitely very excited for that one and then moonstruck i was super excited too because i love that movie it's such a great romantic comedy and i think it's so underrated so to see it getting the criterion treatment was quite a joy i have not seen ghost dog Mm -hmm. i know i need to fix that and i loved the irishman as well so that'll be cool but these two moonstruck and girlfriends are the ones that filled me with joy yeah i mean i like getting irishman which i'll probably get i mean I, i'm not i don't love that film but i'll enjoy probably getting that at some point um moonstruck um i have heard of but i've not seen but i'm interested i would be very excited to watch it and girlfriends yeah it does again i didn't know anything about it until you mentioned some stuff about it but I, that film does pique my interest a lot as well so uh, especially with your descriptions of it um i would be excited to jump into that uh, at some point. But uh, for December, we also have Crash from David Cronenberg. So not the Oscar, well, Oscar winning film Crash, but the uh, David Cronenberg Crash from uh, a few years prior to that. We also have a Robert Brisson movie, um, Mouchette, joining the collection. And if I'm not mistaken, this actually was released previously on DVD by uh, Criteria, but it's been out of print for some time. So very excited for that one. And then we have um, Alejandro Inuritu's, I believe it's his first film, yes. uh, Amores Peros. Mm-hmm. And then we have mm-hmm. um, the one that I can't wait to try to pronounce, some Symbiopsychotaxoplasm, two takes by William Greaves. And that's the lineup for December. I'm very excited about Crash. That's one that's been out of print for a while, and I do have a DVD of it, but of course it's not going to be of the same quality as a a Criterion Blu-ray release, so I'm real excited about that one. If you like movies about um, people being turned on by car crashes, this is the one for you. (laughs) Um, I'm sure that describes so many people in our audience. Chet, I'm excited about as well because I love Pickpocket, which is uh, by Brisson, and um, A Man Escaped is another one of his, Mm. so you've heard of those two this is one that follows a a younger person i haven't seen the movie but i'm excited about it and um yeah the other two look interesting too so there you go yeah i have seen a man escaped which i am quite fond of and i have a copy of pickpocket which i still need to watch but i do like his style and um, i would be excited to jump into 
this uh, newly, well, uh, re-released Blu-ray film. But the part of the thing I'm most excited for is uh, Morris Peros uh, by uh, Inuritu. And I think it has to do with, like, dog fighting and stuff like that. Um, I've only seen, uh, while uh, uh, Inuritu hasn't done t- a terribly lot of movies, he's done uh, Morris Peros, he's done, I think, uh, 21 Grams with Sean Penn and um, Nomi Watts. He's done Babel. There's another film we did with Javier Bardem, which I'm getting the name of. And then I think the only other thing he's done is um, The Revenant. Oh, and Birdman. And I think the only ones I've seen out of that is Birdman. But I very much want to see this film because I think the topic sounds really interesting and uh, this is the feel of it seems really exciting. So I'm very, very excited to see that. And that's actually getting criterion treatment is uh, very exciting. Yeah, it's one that I know I should see, but I am the opposite of you in that the subject matter makes me want to not ever watch it. Yeah, um, I- I love animals, so the idea of watching a movie about dog fighting seems really hard for me, even though I know it's fake and it's not, you know, no dogs were probably harmed in the making of the movie, Mm. but that might be tough for me to watch. So you'll have to let me know how it is and uh, whether, you know, maybe I can handle it after all. Yeah, actually, now that you mentioned that, I probably will have an issue with that. So (laughs) so that would be interesting. So um, I have, as always, not as much time to watch everything that's on the Criterion channel as I'd like before it leaves but there has been some really great stuff on there for september and specifically something that i have made time for and i'm so glad i did was the films of albert brooks Mm -hmm. so real life modern romance lost in america defending your life and mother not to be confused with the other mother Mm -hmm. uh, that came Mm -hmm. out a few years ago this is from 1996 so um albert brooks in most cases wrote and directed and stars in all of these movies and they're hilarious they're humanist they're in a lot of ways kind of critiquing various elements of society or modern life but also not so ironic and detached that you you don't get that that sense of warmth when you watch them um he just really seems to have a great lens on human nature and he has no problem with kind of making fun of himself and letting himself as the actor in these movies kind of portray characters that are a little self-absorbed or neurotic, but I, I really enjoyed, I've watched all five of them now and I really enjoyed them. I think my favorite is definitely defending your life followed by mother, but not a single one of these is a miss. They're all worth seeing for whatever reason or another. So have you seen any of these? And um, if so, what did you think? Uh, I've only seen uh, real life. Um, I saw that a few years ago and I like that. It is kind of the, I know people like Christopher Guest hate this word, but uh, it's kind of a, uh, one of the first, uh, maybe the first uh, mockumentary film, for lack mm-hmm. of a better word. Yeah, it's very good. I, even, I mean, you mentioned he doesn't mind playing unlikable characters, and he's very unlikable in uh, real life. And he even says he's unlikable. He says he's not a good person in that right. movie. But he makes it work, and yeah, it is funny in a kind of a different way slightly subtle and just yeah it's it's different and it's a very albert brooks film which i'm sure carries over to the other four films that i have not seen but i yeah i would love to watch them if i can have time to watch them i definitely will i do love albert brooks he's you know hilarious and certainly uh unique another one that i caught up with was starstruck which is part of the australian new wave collection and that movie is now one of my favorite movies. I absolutely loved it. It's like a new wave, punky kind of musical, and it's very charming and very fun. Great costumes. The characters are lovable. It hit every note that I needed it to, so that was a really fun discovery. And there's also um, some really interesting short films that I've watched on the channel recently, including some by um, Maddie Diop, who did the recent film Atlantics, which was on Netflix last year and one of my favorite films. She has some shorts on the channel that are certainly worth checking out. She worked with her uncle in Senegal on some of these. Um, so Tuki Buki and A Thousand Sons are um, both on the channel and, and certainly worth watching. One of those is a short, one is a feature, so it's part of the short and feature, but she has a few other um, films on there that are worth checking out. And then it's also one that's on my list to check out is Lucretia Motley's filmography. Um, I saw La Cienega already. And then um, The Headless Woman and Zama are also hers. And those are on the channel right now. And she's really like a, a different type of filmmaker. I feel like her vision is very unique and it's from Argentina. And I've enjoyed basically every Argentinian film that I've seen. There haven't been that many, but they all have been really sharp and really interesting. So 
I'm super curious to check those out. Then I believe either on there now or coming very, very soon is Streetwise, which is a documentary that I've always wanted to see. I have not gotten to because it's been unavailable, I believe, for quite a while. But it follows homeless kids and it's especially kind of focused on the ways that they survive with, you know, panhandling and dumpster diving and things like that um, from 1983. So I'll definitely be checking that out. And then one that I've already seen that I highly recommend that'll be there if it's not already, I think it's supposed to be there on September 30th is called The Loveless. And this is Catherine Bigelow's first film. And it also stars Willem Dafoe as a very young leather jacket wearing uh-huh. motorcycle riding guy and it is a very unique experience that um i highly recommend so yeah that's that's one to look for for sure okay so that wrap about wraps us up for today coming up in the next few months um, next month we're going to be doing some halloweeny type uh movies we're going to be doing um island of lost souls cat people and night of the hunter very much looking forward to those and then in november we're celebrating our one-year anniversary um, for the podcast where we're going to be talking about some David Lynch films, primarily uh, Eraserhead, Mulholland Drive, Elephant Man, and Blue Velvet. Again, we're not going to be talking about the Twin Peaks movie, which has been released by Criterion. We'll explain that more in November. But we'll be discussing those four films. And uh, again, I don't know if we're going to be doing a, one big episode for that or if we're going to break that up into maybe a couple episodes, since it will be a longer one. But we'll see what um, when we get closer what we're going to do for that. And then for December, we're going to be doing a couple special things. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, unconventional uh, Christmas movies. And uh, we're also going to be talking about some uh, stuff like wish lists for Criterion. And uh, we may have uh, a, a video component to that podcast, which we can uh, discuss more later. But um, until next time, uh, we, we do do this podcast for our home uh, website 25 years later site.com which you can also find on twitter at 25 yl site and you can find me and links to my um, very uh, seldomly used blog and my very uh, frequently used youtube channel at my twitter account which is at cinema pack rat and you can find me on twitter at rosalie lewis And some of my work is also on fthismovie.com, where I write uh, reviews of lots of different types of movies besides just the Criterion Collection. And that wraps us up for uh, today, so we will see you guys all next time. (laughs) 